सहनाभुनक्थ सह वीन खरवाहै तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मिषावहै ओ शाति 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 हो गुड वेलकम बैक टु आर वेबकास्ट of our class on Shankaracharya's Atma Bodha. We continue today uh, with verse, we'll start with verse 51. You can see so, uh, verses 48 to 52 describe the nature of the enlightened person. We introduced that topic by saying that this, in this section, Sri Shankara makes it very clear what is the goal we seek. If the goal is not clear, our efforts can be misdirected. And in these final two verses of the section, we're going to see first the Jivan Mukta described and then the Dvideha Mukta described. We gave these terms in the, pra- in the past class. Jivan Mukta, one who is Mukta, liberated, freed, Jivan, while still alive. So that liberation is enjoyed not just when you die, but even while you're alive. And then the final verse of this section, we'll talk about that, videha mukta, after the body is is dropped. (coughs) So, that brief introduction, (coughs) let's uh, begin. Repeat after me, please. Upadisto pita dharmar Upadisto pita dharmar alipto vyoma van munihi alipto vyoma van munihi sarva vin mudhavatishthet sarva vin mudhavatishthet asakto vayuvacchareta asakto vayuvacchareta <coughs> Excuse me end of the second line, the subject of the uh, verse is Munihi. Munihi has many meanings, can mean an ancient rishi, can mean one who practices mauna, silence. <coughs> Here it means one who is enlightened. Munihi, the enlightened person who is, in the first, ver- first line, Upadistaha api. Api, even though that enlightened person is Upadistaha, abiding in an upadhi. So ta- Shankara likes that technical term, upadhi, to refer to the body, mind, and senses, <coughs> that which you identify with, that whose attributes get superimposed upon you, that is upadhi. So technical term, but means basically body, mind, senses. So that munihi, that enlightened person, upadistaha api, even though he or she is abiding in a body with a mind and senses, even then, (coughs) aliptaha. Lipta means tainted or affected. Alipta, untainted, unaffected, first line, tad dharmaihi, by the qualities. Dharma here means quality, attributes. Tad dharmaihi, not, not aliptaha, not affected, not tainted, tad dharmaihi, by the dharmas, qualities, tat of that, of that upadhi. The meaning is very clear. We've discussed this particular point several times. And that is, the enlightened person knows that the problems of the body belong to the body. The problems of the senses belong to the senses. If your sight is off or hearing is, is weak, the problems of the senses belong to the sense organs. And the problems of the mind belong to the mind. That's perhaps the biggest one. The sadness in the mind belongs to the mind and, crucially, doesn't affect you, the conscious observer of that sadness, at all. This is one of the main points throughout this Atma Bodha text, is that you, as Shuddha Chaitanya, pure consciousness, are 
utterly untouched, unaffected by anything externally in the world and anything internally having to do with your body, mind and senses. So that enlightened person, even though established in a, with a body, mind and sense complex, that person is aliptaha, utterly unaffected, dharmahi by the attributes, by the problems of the body, mind and senses. And here comes our metaphor, our drishtanta, uh, in the uh, second line, vyomavat, vyoman is one of many words for space. So he says that the enlightened person is unaffected, vyomavat, like space. And here you need to fill in the details to get the uh, metaphor properly. Space is not affected by the clouds that float through. Space is not affected by the color of blue. The blueness you see when you look up doesn't affect space. If, it's, uh, if there's smoke, or nowadays smog, <laughs> if there's smoke or smog or fog, whatever, in the atmosphere, it doesn't affect space at all. Also in ancient times, apparently people would see the, the sky as being a large inverted bowl. They had that sense. Nowadays we know so much about space, we're not likely to see it in that way. But in ancient times, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they would see the sky, especially the night sky, as a large inverted bowl. Well, that bowl has an edge which means that it looks like the sky has a limit or edge at the horizon all around you. But the apparent limitation of what you see doesn't affect space at all. The horizon has a limit. The horizon is a limit. But none, that limit of the horizon or the blueness of the sky or the smoke or smog, whatever, or the blueness, none of that affects space, even though space is present throughout the sky. This is a metaphor. Just like the enlightened person abides in anupadi, body, mind, sense complex, abides within without being affected by it, in the same way space abides in the sky. Space of, yeah, that's fine. Space abides as the enlightened person abides in the body, without being affected, space abides everywhere, including the sky, without being affected by it. Then Shankara continues uh, about that Muni, that enlightened person, that after all is the topic. And here we're seeing the description of the Jivan Mukta, the one who is enlightened while alive. So that Jivan Mukta, that enlightened person, is Sarvavit, Sar, uh, sarvavin due to grammar rules, sarvavit, all-knowing, omniscient. <laughs> but please be careful, Th this is a common misunderstanding. The word sarvavit or sarvagnya are both used to describe the enlightened person. They both mean all-knowing or omniscient. But understand that term properly. When someone gets enlightened, they don't instantly know all the world's languages. When you get enlightened, you don't suddenly know Chinese language or Japanese language. That's not what sarvagnya or sarvavit means here, omniscient. Omniscient, the word is a little misleading. All knowing is literally sarva vit, sarva all, the knower of all. And the knower of all means, but back to our pot, by knowing one clay, thousands and millions of pots are known. You know all the pots by knowing the clay that is the adhishtana, the underlying reality for the pots. In the same way, by knowing Brahman, you know the reality of everything that exists in the cosmos. So everything, the enlightened person knows everything not in detail. The enlightened person doesn't know the details. Ishvara, the god of the universe, knows the details. But the enlightened person knows everything not in detail, 
but in a more fundamental way, knowing Brahman, the reality because of which everything exists. So that sarvavit, that all-knowing, enlightened person, mudhavat tishtet, tishtet, remains mudhavat. My, I don't like my translation here. It says they act like a, mudha can mean fool. So mudhava tishtet, the enlightened person, even though being enlightened, the enlightened person remains like a fool or acts like a fool. That's a poor translation. The common, and it's my translation, no one else to blame. Um, the, the commentator doesn't use, uh, doesn't explain it as someone who's foolish. He says prakrita vat, like an ordinary person, not a foolish person, but an ordinary person. So you can, if you have my, my slides, you can make that correction. Not fool, but ordinary person. What it means here is that the enlightened person be, is like an ordinary person in a sense that they don't have pride. When you become enlightened, <laughs> it, it's so funny. Everyone thinks that enlightenment is, my gosh, you've reached the pinnacle of what it can be achieved in human life. What an amazing accomplishment. For the enlightened person, their perspective is so different. Remember that enlightenment means the removal of ignorance. We've had this discussion several times. The, you don't really get anything, you don't accomplish anything, you gain, don't gain anything, you already are that. That's what the Mahavakya says, Tattvamasi. You are that, you already are that. So enlightenment is getting rid of ignorance. Getting rid of ignorance leaves the enlightened person thinking, how could I have been such a blockhead? <laughs> How could I have been so, so deluded? This is the vision of the enlightened person. Um, oh, that was uh, I was I was going to say, it's a matter of removing ignorance. The removal of ignorance is not a matter for pride. And pardon me for a, a rather crude metaphor. If you have some garbage in your kitchen and it's starting to stink and you take that stinking garbage outside and put it in the bin, do you feel proud <laughs> having taken that garbage out? How silly! That really is a much better description of how it feels to be enlightened. It's not a matter of pride, a matter of relief. When you get rid of the stinking garbage, tremendous relief. When you get rid of the ignorance, which is a cause for suffering, tremendous relief. So, mudhavat tishtet, the person remains not as a fool, but as an enlight as a normal person. Several years ago, not several years ago, a couple of decades ago, I remember uh, everyone was talking about someone in India who was known as Dung Swami. <laughs> he was a Swami, a sannyasi, who had as a spiritual practice, he would lived in a village apparently, and he would sit in a pile of dung. They called him Dung Swami. Now, <laughs> Mudhava you know, to, to give that, that sense of somebody who behaves like a fool, the fact that he sat in a pile of dung, I have no idea why he did it, but that's not evidence of him being enlightened. He may or may not have been enlightened, we have no way of knowing, but behaving like a fool isn't something that goes along with being enlightened. So Mudhavat, not like, again, the translation is incorrect. Not one who behaves like a fool, but one who behaves, again, the literal meaning of mudha is really one who is deluded, one who is ignorant. And the ignorance we're talking about is normal ignorance, the normal, unenlightened person. So in the enlightened person behaves like a normal person without any pride. And that munihi, that enlightened person, asaktaha, being 
unattached to everything, vayuvat charet. Charet, the enlightened person charet, moves about. Vayuvat, another metaphor. Vayu is, is wind, air. <coughs> so the air moves about naturally, according to the laws of nature. The enlightened person being asakta, unattached, or Puja Swami Dayananda like, like to say, the enlightened person has no agenda. Very nice expression, agendaless. So that enlightened person having no agenda behaves according to laws of nature. This needs to be explained. The wind doesn't have an agenda doesn't have its own agenda. Wind blows according to atmospheric, technically I guess it's a difference of, uh, of, of air pressure, barometric pressure in one area is higher, barometric pressure in an another area is lower, and that, ch that pressure gradient, I bore you with all these details, that pressure gradient makes air move. The point here is it's natural. The enlightened person behaves according to nature. When the enlightened person is hungry, eat. <laughs> when the enlightened person is tired, sleep. When you ask an enlightened person to teach, teach. Why not? According to nature. A further point we could say, and this is not the main topic, but it's worth pointing out, nature is not only the physical laws of nature, nature includes the laws of karma. So the enlightened person continues to act according to laws of nature until the body dies. The body continues to live due to prarabdha, karma, the karmas with which the enlightened person was born, according to the doctrine of karma, those karmas with which you're born, prarabdha karma, determine the span of your life, usually. When those prarabdha karmas are exhausted, one's life comes to an end. So as long as those prarabdha karmas remain unexhausted, the enlightened person continues to live naturally, eating, sleeping, teaching, whatever, whatever he or she does. But when those prarabdha karmas are exhausted, then this life comes to an end. And then the jivan mukta, the one who was enlightened while alive, becomes a videha mukta, one who is vid mukta, enlightened, wh while videha, in the absence of a deha, in the absence of the body. We'll see that in the next uh, verse. <coughs> Upadi vilayad vishnau, Upadi vilayad vishnau, Nirvishesham vishen munihi, Nirvishesham vishen munihi, Jale jalam viad vyomni, Jale jalam viad vyomni, te just te jasi vayata, te just te jasi vayata. Nice. <laughs> Again, end of the second line, there's the same word, munihi. There's the subject of our sentence. So this munihi. The prior verse says that Muni who was upadi staha, the Muni who was still inside a body. This verse says Muni he, that enlightened person who is upadi vilayat. Vilayat when there is the dissolution, upadi, of the physical body. When, when there is upadi vilayat, when there is the loss of the body when the body dies, basically. Munihi, when that enlightened person, upadi vilayat, due to the loss of the upadi, when the body dies, then, then what happens? That munihi, vishet, that comes vishen due to grammar rules, vishet enters, enters where? 
or whom, depending on how you want to interpret it. In the end of the first line, Vishnu, into Vishnu. The enlightened person, Vishet, enters Vishnu, enters Vishnu. Now you can take it as Lord Vishnu. You need not, however, because the, the very literal meaning, the root meaning of Vishnu is to be all pervasive. Vish is to enter and to pervade. So Vish, Vishnu is the all pervasive God. So you can take it in the meaning, you can take it as Lord Vishnu, absolutely fine. You can also take it as that which is all pervasive. And in keeping with Shankaracharya's teachings, that actually is a more appropriate meaning in this situation. So Munihi, the enlightened person, Upadi Vilayat, when there is the, the cessation of the function of the Upadi, body, mind, and senses, then that Muni Vish, uh, Vishet enters Vishnau, enters that which is all pervasive. And let me hold off on explaining that because the second half is going to explain that brilliantly, nicely, with some nice metaphors. So the enlightened person enters that which is all pervasive to be explained, nirvisheshaṁ, completely. It's an adverb here. So the Muni loses his individuality entering or merging into that which is all-pervasive. All-pervasive, of course, is a reference to consciousness. Consciousness which has no edge, no boundary, no limit. Of course, the enlightened person, this is the videha mukti, the enlightened person after death. Before death, they already knew, he or she already knew, I am all-pervasive consciousness. In terms of experience, even when you're enlightened, you still have the experience of the limitations of the body and mind. Notice, the enlightened person knows he or she is Brahman. Yet, as long as a body is present, you still have that experience of the body. If you pinch an enlightened person, it's felt. So the experience due to the body remains for the enlightened person as long as the body remains. And having a body is definitely a sense of being limited because you, you have the sense of ending at the edge of your skin. That's a boundary, it's a limit. However, when upadi vilayat, when that Upadhi is removed, then the experience associated with that Upadhi goes away. The experience of limitation goes away. An enlightened person, while alive, experiences the limitations of the body and mind. After the body and, body and mind are gone, there's no experience of limitation. Now, if, if you're thinking, wait a minute, you're the enlightened person still experiences the problems of the body and mind. Remember, the enlightened person knows that the limitations of the body belong to the body, the limitations of the mind belong to the mind, and none of that affects consciousness at all. Atma, the true self, is not affected at all. So don't be confused on that. Experience, no matter what the experience is, doesn't interfere in some way with enlightenment. Enlightenment is fundamentally removing the ignorance and discovering, knowing your true nature. Shankara is famous for saying, jnanam eva moksha. Moksha, liberation is jnanam eva, knowledge and knowledge alone, regardless of the experience. So, when the enlightened person loses the body, mind, and sense complex, upadhi, then the enlightened person merges, becomes one with the all-pervasive consciousness. And now comes a nice metaphor. 
just like, and gives three metaphors. Jale jalam, just like water in water. Here's the metaphor. Again, you have to add a lot of, the, the metaphors are given very briefly here. We have to add a lot. Suppose you have a pot, clay pot, full of water. And suppose you drop that pot full of water into the sea. Even nicer. Suppose the pot is not fired, it's unbaked, raw, raw clay pot. If you drop that pot into the sea, that the, the clay will melt away, the pot will dissolve in the seawater. So look at this, the water that was in the pot seems, so you have to picture it, this pot of water in the sea. There's water inside, there's water outside. But there seems to be a division between inside water and outside water due to the pot. But when the pot dissolves into the seawater, when the pot disappears, how can you distinguish between pot water and seawater? There is only one water. We've used the metaphor in a, in, a, in a different way, and that's the second metaphor, viat uh, vyomni, just like space merging into space. First metaphor, jalam jale, jalam, water, merging into jale, into water. Second metaphor, viat is space, merging into vyomni, merging into space. Now, what do you mean space merging into space? That's a more familiar metaphor. That's our pot. Right now, there is pot space inside and there's room space outside. There seems to be some division between pot space and outside space. But when this pot disappears, remember the metaphor is like the, the enlightened person drops the body Dropping the body is, is like the disappearance of the pot. When the pot disappears, the, uh, watch the language. When the pot disappears, the apparent difference, underline that word. When the pot disappears, the apparent difference between pot space and room space disappears. In the same way, when you drop the body-mind-sense complex, the apparent difference between the limited individual conscious being and the vast all-pervasive consciousness, that apparent difference goes away. The apparent difference is due to the presence or absence of the upadi. Whether it's the pot in the sea or the pot in space, the presence of the pot, which is an upadi, causes the apparent difference. When the upadi disappears, the apparent difference disappears. So too, when the body-mind-sense complex disappears, the apparent distinction between individual consciousness and vast all-pervasive consciousness, that apparent difference disappears. Last metaphor. Tejas, tejasi va yata. Yata just va or yata just as tejas, fire. It can mean light, but here it means fire. Uh, tejas, tejasi, just like fire is merged into fire. This is perhaps a, a reference, I think the metaphor comes in Mundaka Upanishad, referring to sparks emitted by a fire. Nice metaphor. Imagine a blazing fire. And that blazing fire emits a spark. That spark, the fire is made of fire, the spark is made of fire. That spark is emitted by the fire, but moments later, that spark falls back into the fire. While this, after the spark has been emitted, while it's floating up in the air, it looks different. It's, it's somehow separate from the fire, but moments later, that spark falls back, that ember, burning ember, falls back into the fire, 
and becomes utterly non-separate from the fire. Nice metaphor. We are all a little bit like sparks emitted by a fire and then temporarily individual. We have a temporary experience of individuality. Notice how carefully I'm choosing the words here. We have a temporary experience of individuality. That experience begins when you're born, maybe even at conception, I don't know. But when you're born, you have an, a temporary experience of individuality. That experience continues as long as you're alive. When you drop the body, the experience of individuality goes away. It's like that ember falling back into the fire. Notice, we can say then that after you're dead, sorry to use bold, simple, crude words like that, after you're dead, there's no experience of individuality. You remain experientially non-separate from Brahman. The only difference is, if you're not yet enlightened, the laws of karma will drive your sukshma sharira to acquire another physical body. You'll be born again, and when you're born again, another temporary experience of individuality arises. When that sense of individuality is arises, you no longer feel yourself non-separate from Brahman. But for the enlightened person, all the prarabdha karmas are, are destroyed, all the sanchitta and agami karmas are, I don't want to go through the whole doctrine of karma, a long complicated thing. But we can say the enlightened person is completely freed from all those karmas, they're all burnt up in jnana agni, in the fire of wisdom, all the karmas are burnt up. Therefore, the enlightened person never again gets reborn into a temporary experience of individuality. The enlightened person remains always and forever experientially non-separate from Brahman. Experientially, I'm using that word very deliberately. Right now, you are non-separate from Brahman. Right now, enlightened or not. <laughs> Because there's only Brahman. If there's only Brahman, how can anything be separate? But there's an experience of separation. There's an experience of individuality. And it's that, experien that experience of individuality that goes away at death. If you're not enlightened, the experience of individuality comes back. If you are enlightened, the experience of individuality doesn't come back. And that concludes the section on the nature of an enlightened person. We now come to the next section, knowledge of Brahman. Obviously, knowledge of Brahman is utterly unlike any other kind of knowledge. It's not like knowledge of an individual object like a, like a pot but it's more like knowledge of the clay. Of course, this is not a great metaphor because of, you're seeing this pot in my hand. The better metaphor is to understand Brahman as the technical term, sarva adhishtana, the adhishtana, the underlying substratum, reality for sarva, because of which everything exists, I've used the term fabric of existence, that underlying reality that gives existence to everything, just like clay gives existence to a pot, in the same way Brahman gives existence to everything. So therefore, knowledge of Brahman is not like knowledge of an individual thing. Knowledge of Brahman is knowledge of the underlying reality because of which everything exists and Shankaracharya gives a number of verses to explain that knowledge of Brahman. 
यल्लाभानापरो लाभो यल्लाभानापरो लाभो यत्सुखानापरम सुखम यत्सुखानापरम सुखम यद्ज्ञानानापरम ज्ञानम यद्ज्ञानानापरम ज्ञानम तद्ब्रम हेत्यवधारयेत तद्ब्रम हेत्यवधारयेत so describing that knowledge of brahman in three different ways yat labhat 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 here following the labha is acquisition gaining labhat compared to the acquisition of which yat and here yat refers to brahman compared to the acquisition of brahman yat labhat in comparison na aparaha labhaha there is na there is not aparaha anything else labhaha that can be obtained nice kind of poetic language Brahman is that gaining which I use some simple language Brahman is that gaining which there is nothing else to be gained Brahman as that sarva adhishthana as that underlying reality because of which everything exists when you you don't gain that brahman the word labha literally means gain but it's used in a in a metaphoric sense here to gain brahman means to know brahman so knowing that brahman as the underlying reality because of which everything exists nothing is left out brahman is the reality because of which everything exists so knowing that underlying substratum nothing is left out so the language here by the way this verse is this verse and the actually the the series of three verses quite poetic and poetic means they're not so much for detailed analysis but they're more to be enjoyed so to speak to be appreciated yet labhat na aparaha labho gaining brahman there is no greater and that's a nice translation there is no greater gain than gaining brahman from my translation here gaining which nothing remains to be gained is fine but but try this gaining brahman well that's this one gaining which there's nothing compared to the gain of brahman there is no greater gain yet sukhat compared to the sukha the joy the contentment the peace i'm not i'm avoiding the word happiness even though su or and pleasure even sukha is, is commonly translated as happiness or pleasure these verses are at a very high level so we're talking about perfect peace and perfect contentment that one gains being enlightened yat sukhat compared to that perfect contentment and peace having discovered your true nature as brahman na aparam sukham there is no other sukha no other contentment or peace that compares there is no better peace or contentment than the peace and contentment one gains in the discovery of brahman why brahman is the source of all peace and contentment early on in this text we discussed how the true source of contentment peace joy and happiness lies within your true nature as satchidananda atma then in later verses we saw how that satchidananda atma that true self the true source of contentment and peace is absolutely the same as brahman 
the underlying reality because of which everything exists. That's Tattvamasi. So, yat, yat Sukhat, compared to the contentment and peace one gains, having discovered your true nature as Brahman, na aparam sukham. There is no greater sukha, no greater contentment, no greater peace, no greater happiness or joy. Fine. Yat jnanat, compared to that jnana, knowledge of Brahman, na aparam jnanam, there is no greater knowledge, there is no better knowledge than knowledge of Brahman. That's not a bad translation. There is no better knowledge than knowledge of Brahman. Why? Knowledge of computers can give you a job, or maybe not. <laughs> knowledge of cooking can allow you to cook some tasty food and enjoy that, but those are limited benefits. Limited knowledge gives limited benefits. Here, we're talking about knowledge of the limitless. So if, if a limited knowledge gives a limited benefit, then knowledge of limitless Brahman yields a limitless benefit. In more technical sense, I just saw my note here, this knowledge culminates in moksha, as I quoted before, Shankara says, jnana meva moksha. Moksha, liberation, is knowledge and knowledge alone. Moksha, <coughs> as many of you know, is the ultimate goal of life. It's called parama purusharta. Purusharta, goal of life. Parama, the ultimate goal of life. Moksha is the ultimate goal of life. And that ultimate goal of life is gained through knowledge of Brahman. So, having given these three ways in which this knowledge of Brahman is the ultimate knowledge, he then, Shankara then concludes, Tad Brahma iti avadharayet. Tat Brahma iti. The word iti is like uh, quotation marks in Sanskrit. Tat Brahma is the recognition that is Brahman. To know your true nature as Brahman. Tat Brahma. Tat, that Satchirananda Atma, which is my true nature. Tat Brahma. That Tat is the Tat from Tat Twam Si. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> tat Brahma Iti. Knowing Brahman in that way, iti avadharayet. Thus, it should be ascertained. You should ascertain, you should realize, you should gain that knowledge of Brahman. That, that final, these final words, tad Brahma iti avadharayet, is going to be repeated uh, six times in the coming verses. Not every single verse, but six times in the next series of verses, tad brahma iti avadharayet. That Brahman should be recognized, should be realized, should be ascertained. We'll see it come again and again. Next. Yadrishtva naparam drishyam Yadrishtva naparam drishyam Yad bhutva napunar bhavaha Yad bhutva napunar bhavaha Yad jnatva naparam yeyam Yad jnatva naparam yeyam Tad brahm het yavadharayeta Tad brahm het yavadharayeta Very similar to the previous verse. Yat drishtva, all the way through this pronoun yat, that which, refers to Brahman. Yat, yat drishtva, having seen that Brahman, seen again metaphorical usage, having discovered, having known, having seen that Brahman, having discovered that Brahman, na aparam drishyam, <coughs> there is nothing better to be seen, nothing, nothing better to be discovered, Really speaking, there's nothing else 
to be discovered. Recognizing the underlying substratum because of which everything exists, you recognize that everything is Brahman, there's nothing other than Brahman. So in that sense, na apram drashyam, there's nothing else that exists other than Brahman that can be understood or discovered. Yat bhutva na punar bhavaha. Yat bhutva, having become that Brahman. <coughs> Excuse me. And another metaphorical usage, bhutva, having become. Do you become Brahman? We've discussed too many times. You already are that. There's an apparent becoming. The apparent becoming takes place when you get rid of ignorance. When you remove the apparent separation between you and Brahman, there is the experience of becoming Brahman, but the reality is you've always been Brahman. Again, we've said, exper experientially, you may feel separate from Brahman, but in Videha Mukti, when you drop the body, then yet Bhutva, having lost the experience of separation, you Bhutva are now experientially non-separate from Brahman, and then what? Na punaha bhavaha. There is no punaha bhavaha. Puna bhava is a, is a term for rebirth. Bhava, existence, birth. Punaha, again, punar bhava means rebirth. Na punar bhava, there is no rebirth. As we explain, all the karmas are burnt up. When the enlightened person drops the physical body, and becomes experientially non-separate from Brahman, Napunar Bhavaha, there is no rebirth for that one who has enlightened the Videha Mukta. Yadnyatva na aparam brahma. Almost the same as the third line in the prior verse. Yat nyatva, having known which, having discovered that Brahman na aparam nyayam, there is nothing else to be discovered. Again, Brahman being the sarva adhishtana, the other underlying reality of all, knowing the fabric of existence, everything is known to you in essence. The stars and galaxies, billions of years, billions of miles away, they're known to you in essence because you know Brahman, the underlying reality because of, what, of which they exist. Tad Brahma iti avadharayet. Therefore, you should ascertain what is that Brahman. Tad Brahma, that is Brahman. This understanding should be ascertained. We'll see this one next, next, next verse. It seems to finish a series here nicely. Yeah. Tirya gur dhamadah purnam Tirya gur dhamadah purnam Satchidananda madvayam Satchidananda madvayam Anantam nityam ekam yata, Anantam nityam ekam yata, Tad brahm het yavadhara yet, Tad brahm het yavadhara yet. It's the third time ending with that refrain, as it were, Tad brahma iti avadhara yet. You should ascertain. What is that Brahman, Tad Brahma? And that Brahma is, backing up one line, Yat, that Brahman is Yat, that which is, now go up to the top, that Brahman is Yat, that which is, that which is Purnam. Purnam means full. And here Shankara gets very elaborate. Again, this is poetic. This is really not so much meant for, for detailed analysis. It's really meant to be enjoyed poetically. 
that Brahman is Purnam, full. Full in which way? Tiryak, on the sides. Urdhvam, above. Adaha, below. So in every direction, m- nice translation, and extending endlessly, good, around, above, and below, that fullness is Brahman. Brahman is that fullness extending in every direction. Brahman extends in every direction because Brahman is that fabric of existence. Brahman is that which is Sat Chit Anandam Advayam. Satcharananda, the famous three words that we often use to describe your true nature. But again, your true nature is non different from Brahman. How could it be otherwise? The reality because of which the universe exists and the reality because of which you exist cannot possibly be two different realities. Tattvamasi. That's what the Mahavakya reveals. And that Satchirānandam, that the essence of who you are, is advayam, non-dual. Why is it non-dual? Brahman is a fabric of existence. There's only one fabric of existence. And your consciousness is not different from my consciousness. Consciousness is all-pervasive. That all-pervasive consciousness is the fabric of existence. It, that, that consciousness is anantam, boundaryless, limitless. Nityam, eternal. Eternal means unborn, uncreated. Sometimes I see that word in Pujya Swami Dayananda, like to joke, that nityam is not like styrofoam. He uses a, that metaphor. Because when you put styrofoam in a landfill, when you put it in the garbage, you know it ends up in, un, in buried in a landfill someplace. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that styrofoam will still be there in, in, the, uh, in the landfill. Eventually, that styrofoam will decompose. Not in, not in, maybe not in a hundred years, but eventually. So nityam doesn't mean that which hangs around for a long time like styrofoam. Nityam means unborn, uncreated, unchanging. That which exists outside of time is nityam. And it is ekam, one. That fabric of existence, which is all pervasive consciousness, is one. One fabric of existence because of which everything exists. One all-pervasive consciousness because of which all living beings can think and feel. Tad yat, that which is, that one fabric of existence or one consciousness, yat, that is tat brahma, that is brahman, iti avadharayet. Thus, it should be realized, it should be understood. Very good. We'll continue next time. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchadukha Bhagbaveta Asatoma Satgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityor Ma Hamratangamaya, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om Tatsat. Mm-hmm.